So ever since the inception of the one-time transfer rule in the transfer portal, that's been something that's dominated the interest of college football fans. And look, for good reason. We have seen countless big moves occur via the transfer portal that are sure to have some sort of tangible effect on the way the season will play out. But today, we need to talk about the events of this weekend, in which case all of that interest surrounding the transfer portal seemed to come to a head, and we have heard a word tossed around consistently this weekend in relation to the transfer portal, and that word is tampering. And today, we need to break that down and why this is something we've been being warned about for quite some time, and those warnings have seemingly fallen on deaf ears. So before we do that, as always, y'all know the drill. I need to hear from you. Hop down to the comments, why for yes and for no. Do you believe that the NCAA will be forced to, at some point, create more bright lines surrounding the transfer portal and NIL? Let me know what you're thinking. If you are new to the channel, be sure to subscribe. Hit that bell notification as I do constant college football content. You don't want to miss any of it. And if you enjoyed the content, like and comment down below as those interactions, though small, are incredibly impactful to content creators such as myself and both getting picked up and maintained by the YouTube algorithm. But having said all of that, let's jump right in into this because this is something that's dominated college football headlines since this weekend. The Jordan Addison situation has truly taken the nation by storm. And one word we're consistently hearing through it all is tampering. And that's really had me thinking, what does the tampering look like in college football's current landscape? And if you really go back this is something that multiple collegiate coaches have talked about and have warned against. Some of them have put their name and attached it to the statement. Others have remained anonymous. But the one theme you're seeing is that this isn't a new problem. And in fact, there were articles in 2021 in ESPN talking about how there was already tampering rampant in college football, or at least a coach felt like there was tampering that was rampant in college football. In 2017, Nick Saban actually spoke about tampering within college football and said there needed to be some sort of civility agreement amongst the coaches, similar to what they have in the NFL. Fast forward to now, and this issue has reared its ugly head once again. This time, it's in relation to not only the one-time transfer rule, but also NIL. This is where this situation gets incredibly interesting, because if we go back in time to 2021 in that first article I referenced, in which case a coach who chose to remain anonymous was already saying in May of 2021 that tampering is alive and well in college football, that was before NIL had been fully introduced and rolled out. Once NIL was introduced and rolled out, inevitably that was only going to complicate issues all around college football. No matter what facet of college football you were in, that absolutely added another wrinkle that must be accounted for. And because of that, it makes complete sense that we're seeing that in relation to the transfer portal because NIL is going to change at some level every facet of the college game because now you just have another factor you have to worry about. But what about tampering in the situation of Jordan Addison? Because that's something that we heard, and surprisingly, per Pete Thamel, we heard that it wasn't just out of some newsroom that this was being alleged. This was from Pat Narduzzi himself, the head coach of Pittsburgh, who allegedly has called Lincoln Riley, the head coach of USC, multiple times in order to air out how displeased he is with this current situation and with what he feels to be tampering on the part of USC. So when I read about Pat Narduzzi calling Lincoln Riley and saying that he felt like tampering had occurred, one question popped to my mind, and it was in relation to NIL and tampering. And let me explain the line of logic that led me to this question, because one of you may have the answer, and if you do, drop it down in the comments, I'd love to hear it. But in order for me to explain this line of logic, I have to reference again that article that came out in ESPN in May of 2021, in which case the coach who chose to remain anonymous was talking about all of the ways tampering was already rampant in college football. One such way is that players would contact players of a different institution to gauge the temperature. Another such way was the use of high school coaches, in which case an institution would call a high school coach and say, hey coach, we recruited one of your guys a year or two ago and it didn't work out, but we're calling today to see are they happy where they currently are. And in doing so, a seed is planted so that the next time that high school coach is talking to his former player, if that former player airs out any grievances in terms of I'm concerned about X, Y, and Z, or I'm worried about my playing time, 
That coach remembers the conversation he just had a week or so prior and says to his former player, I think there are greater opportunities for you that you don't even realize, and maybe they don't lie at your current institution. If it was already that easy to work around the transfer laws on the books, what happens when NIL is introduced into all of this? And the reason I ask that is because when we look around the nation right now, we see all of these NIL groups popping up, and they're facilitating name, image, and likeness deals to student athletes, as is well within their rights. But when we look at it, these NIL groups are working independently of institutions, or at least in theory, they should be working independently of these institutions. But what's to stop one of these NIL groups who are perfectly, like I said, well within their right to to contact student athletes in regards to name, image, and likeness business opportunities from contacting an individual halfway across the nation and saying, hey, we have all these opportunities for you. What's to stop that from happening? Because in that instance, the NIL groups are effectively now the proxies that the high school coaches used to be, except now these proxies are much more organized and have a lot of money at their disposal. Two things that completely muddy the situation. And it might be easy to say, well, yes, that's still tampering. But one of the things we have to realize is you have to be able to establish the line. And if you can't establish the line saying that this institution directed this NIL group to act this way, well, then the NIL group can just claim that they were a sole actor or the institution could just claim that NIL group, that individual was acting on their own accord, not at the direction of us. And we can't be held accountable for every person who goes to a student athlete and says, hey, you should transfer to X institution X. That's where this gets really, really murky. That's where this gets really, really muddied. And that's why we had a problem already in college football, introduced name, image, and likeness and the one-time transfer rule and expected things to get better. And I'm a proponent of both of those things, but I'm also a proponent for doing them in a way that's conducive for success. Because when we look and we really take apart what these coaches have been warning about, and there have been big-named coaches warning about this, from Nick Saban to Jimbo Fisher to Dabo Sweeney to ironically Lincoln Riley and finally Lane Kiffin just to name a few and countless others have also warned about this but chose to remain anonymous both head coaches assistant coaches ADs so many people have put their warning label on this and now we're kind of seeing some of the implications to this and one thing we need to understand I am completely for NIL and I'm completely for the transfer portal those two things are something I've talked about consistently, and I have a deep love for college football, but it also would be facetious of me to sit here and pretend that everything is perfect. I am someone that believes NIL can work in college football, and it can work just fine, but it has to be done correctly, and the transfer portal is something that can work in college football and be beneficial for all parties involved, but it must be done correctly, and right now, I feel like this is almost a beta test of sorts, where the NCAA is just throwing this out there and seeing how the free market responds, and it creates a situation where they're hoping that the market is going to correct itself, but we're also dealing with things that don't necessarily make logical sense. And what I mean is, we're also in a situation where reportedly these NIL collectives are paying kids or signing deals with kids that have never played a down of collegiate football for millions of dollars. At that point, reason has kind of gone out the door. And so for the NCAA to look at the situation and hope that the market will correct itself based on reason, even though all actions up to this point have been completely unreasonable, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And that's one of the major issues I see in all of this. However, this issue isn't relegated to just Jordan Addison, as we have heard reports yesterday that Texas had to fend off Xavier Worthy. And that's why I really haven't focused solely on the Jordan Addison situation, because this problem is much larger than that. This isn't a problem that just popped up with Jordan Addison. And sadly, I don't think this is going to be a problem that ends with Jordan Addison. Now, hopefully, through all of this, we can get more bright lines established from the NCAA on how all of this is supposed to happen so that that way NIL and the transfer portal can exist in college football and that it can exist in a manner that's conducive to success. But right now, 
there's a lot of damage being done to the image of college football, and that's going to be hard to repair, and that's something I deeply worry about. But this issue is incredibly intriguing, because right now the eyes of the college football world are watching and wondering what Jordan Addison is going to do, and Jordan Addison has unfortunately become the face of quote-unquote tampering within college football. This is not a new problem. This is not a problem that started with the institutions that have been named in connection to the Jordan Addison situation. This is a problem that has existed long before that. This is a problem that Jimbo Fisher just talked about a month ago. This is a problem Lane Kiffin just talked about a month ago, that Nick Saban just talked about around a month ago. This is a problem that we've been being warned about we just all kind of chose to ignore it because it didn't happen right in front of our eyes. But now we're watching it play out. And this is why this is going to be such an interesting situation in college football. Not only when you have the Jordan Addison situation, but then when you get news out of Texas that, yeah, the Texas Longhorns had to fend off multiple offers for Xavier Worthy, an individual who, per my knowledge, was never even thinking about entering the transfer portal. And now you are able to contact kids in regards for NIL dealings, and those NIL dealings could be for an entirely different institution, and that... That's where we currently are for college football. Hop down to the comments. Let me know what you're thinking because as I said in the intro, I think there's no way whatsoever that this is a sustainable practice. And I'm someone who loves college football and I don't even love it for what the X's and O's are on the field. Don't get me wrong. I love that. I love college football for the hope it creates and not only for the athletes present, but for everybody involved. Because as Miriam Williamson said in the quote from one of my favorite movies ever, Coach Carter, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And once we find our light, we unconsciously give everybody around us the opportunity and the permission to find theirs. And I got to watch that firsthand when two of my good friends went to play college football. I got to watch the attitude of a hopeless town somehow gain hope. And individuals who didn't know that there was a reality outside of what we had known all of a sudden began to dream. And that was something that was awesome to see. And that's why I wanted to make this transition from the legal world to something like this, because it meant a lot to me. But I'm very interested in hearing from all of you. Hop down to the comments. Let me know what you're thinking. That's it. See you.